So I always wanted to be a guru in my own sense. Um, and and uh, since you guys are sitting down low, I'll sit down as well. And uh, how many of you are doing startups? All right. Um, how many of you already have a startup? What, what kind? Uh, and what kind? Cool. How many people in your company? Five. Great. Who else? Uh, we're doing mobile games, so we're, we're building a video game right now for the iPhone. Watch out, Zynga, right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Good. Anybody else? Building an app to teach people to meditate daily. Yep. Great. Cool. But I bet you're not meditating when you're building it, are you? It's kind of hard. Yeah, you can take a five minute break. Uh -huh. Better. <laughs> Better. Um, who, who, else is, uh, who else is doing one? Mm -hmm. It's uh, focusing on augmented reality. Okay. So making like virtual tours of campuses and events. Great. Good. And um, how many of you want to do one? Uh, who haven't raised your hand? Um, so, so one of the things I think you're going to get out of uh, this program is, is learning all the tricks and techniques and mental attitude to build the startup. But um, we've now kind of learned stuff in Silicon Valley over the last 40 years of not only what to do, but what not to do. Anybody ever um, uh, hear about a business plan? Anybody ever know what a business plan is? Anybody ever have to write one? Um, you know, what Tim might actually admit, um, if he was in a good mood, is that business plans are the documents that VCs make you write that they don't read. Um, and, um, right? and so, what we've now know after 40 years is this document called the business plan. Anybody know what a business plan is supposed to do? Who's written one? All right. What's it supposed to do? Well, it's supposed to define your company's goals, what your target market is, et cetera. Your... Great. What else? Target market. Keep going. What, what else is in it? It's just a tell a story. It's a yeah. story. Yeah. And, and what's in it? And so your, your financial projections. Financial projections, right? Risks. Include your income statement. Yep. Uh, your, your, well, I was going to say clinical need, but your need. Yep. The need you've identified if you're Yep, good. What else? It's supposed to include why your company's going to be successful. Why it's going to be successful, yeah. And, and why is that? How can you tell that in a story? What else do you put in there? What else do you put in the plan? Competitors. Competitors, good. Projections of what you think they're going to accomplish in the future. Projections, yep. Yep, anybody else? Market size and the team. Market size, right? How big is this going to be? It's going to be big, right? It's going to be huge. In fact, anything else? Who's on the team? Who's on the team, right? Business plan kind of is this great organizing document. Um, if you go online, you can see almost every VC will uh, somewhere in their website will tell you about how the plan should be organized for when you submit one to them. And in fact, if you get to come into a venture capitalist and actually pitch or present your company, your slides are historically just kind of a sum of what your business plan is. That's how we did it for 40, 50 years in Silicon Valley. I'm going to tell you some bad news. The bad news is, well, no, I'll let you guys figure out the bad news. Anybody uh, who wrote the plan actually start a company? All right. Anybody else? All right. What happened to your plan? It changed drastically. Well, why? You wrote it down. <laughs> Because uh, things like it includes a budget, for example. And if you're staying within budget, what you're allocating for right. money to changes. Why did it change? You wrote it down. What happened? There were events or things that happened that you didn't plan for. Well, like what? How could you? How could that possibly happen? No, seriously, how could it happen? Uh, other, you're relying on other people and other people's decisions. So if there's aren't aligned with yours, you change it. Yep. Any any other reasons? Yep. You're right. Uh, bad economic times. Yeah. So the so the we could blame it. We could blame but our projections were right, but the economy just didn't like happen as we predicted, exactly. right? So you, right. you and the rest of Wall Street, right? right. Anybody else? <laughs> so here's something we now know. Forty years, no business plan survives first contact with customers. It's a big idea. Business plan is a document uh, that you write with vision and passion um, and, in fact, is almost always wrong. 
It's a wonderful organizing document. Think about team, forces you to do some research. But the mistake we've made for decades is believing that as soon as you get money, all you need to do is execute the plan. And that's a fatal error. In fact, most successful startups, almost all of them, don't end up as per their business plan. It's a huge idea. And that forecast, the financials that you put in your back of the plan, usually, does anybody know how many years you forecast out in a typical plan? Three, four, years. Three, four five years sometimes. Anybody know a country that used to have five-year plans? Yeah, who else? Russia. Right, Soviet Union, right? These five-year forecasts in the back of startup business plans are as accurate as the five-year plans in the Soviet Union, right? Which means they're really not very useful. And so I'm not here to tell you all about the bad things about a business plan. I am going to tell you about the key things about a startup. Right? A startup starts with a founder with a vision. Somebody who believes you see something that other people don't. And that you have a passion to make that real. That's what a founder is. Some of you have a, a vision. You want passion. Make something real. Okay? That's a founder. For those of you who don't, okay, don't force it. Don't force. It took me five startups before I was able to be something other than an early employee. But founders are somebody who can't get their idea out of their head, that this is an itch you've got to scratch. It's a, it's a drug. It's something that you want to bring to life. And the good news is that founders have irrational optimism. The bad news is, is founders have a rational optimism. And that most of the time, what you believe is a vision actually turns out to be a hallucination. And so the question is, how do we separate visions from hallucinations? And the question is, how do we turn what's essentially a faith-based activity on day one into facts? Because a startup on the first day of your company is essentially a faith-based activity. As much as you write it down, as much as you format the document of your business plan, most of you will have no facts. All you will have is your opinions. And the bad news is that as smart as you are, most of your opinions are wrong on day one. Now, you could hear this and go, well, that's pretty depressing. Why should I go do a company? The good news is we now know, again, after 40 years, how to do the right way of doing a startup. And that's just assume that everything you think about your new business, everything, is simply nothing more than a series of untested hypotheses. What's a hypothesis? We know what that fancy word is. What's a hypothesis? You know? It's a logical guess about it. Guess, a guess, right? A hypothesis is a fancy word for guess. And you should know, I use the word hypothesis a lot at Stanford because they pay $50,000 a year and they love to tell their parents they learn something important every day, all right? But really what we're telling them is they are actually guessing. So a startup on day one is a series of untested guesses. How many of you are passionate about your idea? Great, you're wrong. Meaning, not your passion is wrong, but almost everything about your idea, you are going to find out is just a guess. Did you have a passionate idea? Great. Who are your customers? Uh, anybody who wants to use social networks. Great, who's that? Anybody from 15 to 8. Yeah, that's about a billion people, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, All right. How do you know? How do I know? Yeah, how do you know those are your customers? Because those are the people who are actively using. Have you talked to any of them? Sure. Yeah, and are they going to pay for your product? Uh, they don't have to. Are, are they going to use it? Yes, sir. How, how do you know? I believe it. Ah, right. Faith-based, isn't it? Right. So one of the things you want to have happen is, right now, this is a faith-based company. 
that you believe they are all going to use. Right? And if you now spent, how long is it going to take you to build the product? Well, hopefully three months. Right? So if you waited to the end of three months right, and got it out there and no one used it, how are you going to feel? Inspired. <laughs> no, you're not. How are you really going to feel? Terrible. Terrible. Why? Because no one is doing what I want them to do. But why? Why would you feel terrible? You, everything that you work for can fall apart. Yeah, you wasted some time. You might have wasted some money, etc. What if I told you that it was possible in three days to figure out whether people were actually going to use it or not. That would be useful. That would be very useful. Turns out there's a process to do just that. Turns out there's a process to simply think about what are all the hypotheses or guesses that make up your startup, write them down, and figure out, instead of building your entire product and only finding out at the end whether you're right, is to actually start testing those guesses as soon as possible. And what are the guesses? So what makes up a company? When you're building something, we talked about, what are we talking about right now? What are we talking about? What was one of the key things that you need to have in your company? Um, a mission. No, 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 that's just motherhood. What, what, what did you really talk about? Cars. Customers, right? Yeah. You need to have customers, isn't that a key idea? Yes. Yeah. So one of the key elements of any business model or any components of a company is who are the customers, right? Who else is doing a startup? You. Uh, who are your customers? Uh, gynecologists and reproductive endocrinologists. Uh, gynecologists and reproductive endocrinologists. Great. Living where? Um, we're currently aiming to, but our, we're at all across the U.S. Private practice or group practice? Uh, private and public. The requirements are they have to have a capital equipment called a hysteroscope and office. And ah, so you, you actually have to find your customer in some detail, yes, I right? Talk to You've talked to many of them. Oh, well, here we have somebody who's actually tested some hypotheses, right? some facts, and here we have faith, right? Interesting. Um, what are the other uh, important parts of a company? What else do you need to know to build a company? What else do you need to know? Customers. What else? I'm going to call on somebody. For, sorry? You need to know how to build your product. All right. Uh, how to build it? Yeah. Okay. What else do you need to know? Cost. Suppliers, yep. What else do you need to know? Cost of everything. Cost, yep. What else do you need to know? All right. If you can rely on the people working with you and for you. Yep, whether you have a great team. What else? What else do you need to know? You're selling something. What do you need to know? You need to know what people want or what people are going to react to. Great, what their needs are, right? What, what job they want you to get done for them. What else? Regulations. Boy, if you're doing a medical device, you got a new partner, don't you? Who, who's the partner? Yeah. yeah, the government, right? Regulations, right? Maybe the insurance companies as well. Well, you need to know that someone else hasn't already done an idea. Competitors? So, so let me go all the way to the top and give you a concept about the things you need to know. It turns out that every company, everyone, whether you're doing a video game or a medical device or whether you're Apple, or whether you're Salesforce.com or Facebook, has something called a business model. It's a, it's a phrase you should know. And a business model is a fancy term for how companies create value, that is, how they make something, and how they collect money for that, what they make. And a business model has nine parts, at least Steve's definition, and a guy named Alexander Osterwalder says there are nine parts to a business model. Number one is, who are your customers? So if I were taking notes, I'd write down customers. Two is, what product or service you're building for those people? What are you building? Now, some people call that, and use a fancy name for it, called value proposition. But think of it as, what am I building and for who? Third piece I'd probably want to know is, how am I going to get the product from my company to those customers. How are you going to get the product to customers? Internet. Internet, web. Who's doing the medical device? How are you going to get the product to customers? Uh, hopefully through um, distribution centers like Hologic or larger medical device companies. 
great. So you're going to have actually a distribution channel. There might be real people involved, right? right human beings. You, you used to be called the direct sales force or maybe an indirect channel, right? Third part is, or fourth part is, how are you going to get people to know about your product? How do you get people to know about a product? How do you get people to know about a product? Marketing. Yeah. Advertising. advertising? Well, how else? What, what kind of advertising? Um, maybe target specific areas where your customers get their information. Great. Well, give me some more examples. You're on a roll. Um, so if you are doing like medical devices, yep. like medical journals, Right, that could be print ads, right? And if you were on the net, what would you do? Um, go to like the blogs. Right, know. yeah, SEO or SEM, and you know. So, so the fourth thing you need to think about in a business model is what are called customer relationships. How do you get, keep, and grow customers? Then the fifth thing you need to think about, and I was surprised none of you mentioned this, <laughs> which later in your career you will be worrying about a lot, is how do you make money? What's the revenue model? And what are the pricing tactics? And then a good number of you mentioned, do you need any partners, number six? Do you need to do anything special, like manufacture or, or be any uh, uh, expert in any domain? So what activities do you need to do? Number eight is, do you need any resources? Do you need iron ore if you're making steel? Do you need great software engineers if you're building a software company? And the ninth part is, what are all the costs? These nine things are called the business model. Every startup ultimately ne needs to know about all those pieces. And on day one, for most of it, is all you have are guesses. All you are is guessing. You might be passionately guessing, but you're guessing. And the two most important things you're guessing about, you, 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 are about the product and about the customers. Figuring out what do people want you to build for them and whether you built the right thing is called product market fit. And what you're looking for is to make sure that all the energy you're putting into all those features or code or hardware or whatever match what some set of customers actually not only care about, but will ultimately use your pay. Does that make sense? But as smart as you are, there is no way sitting in this building or in a classroom or when you leave here in your office or dorm or whatever that you can know that stuff by just telepathy or by writing a plan. As smart as you are, you cannot pre-compute Knowledge. So where would you get it? How would you find out? How would you find out? Yes, the don't call on me look, you. How would you find out? Market research. Really, what's market research? So you go, or you do, uh, you have people come and test out products. And see yeah. if they actually like it, what their, uh, what their ideas about it is, whether they actually use it. Mm-hmm. All right. What else would you do? Yes. Yes. The other don't call on me. Maybe go to, like, people who, like, you consider your competitors and the people who, like, shop there and see what they Yeah, are. I'd certainly check out competitors. Yep. Good. What else would you do? Okay. Um, well, you'd also uh, figure out what your customers want. Yeah, how would you do that? Good. How would you figure that out? Talk to them. You would do what? Talk to the customers. Oh my gosh. You would talk to your customers? <laughs> right? How would you know they're your customers? Well, you would figure out what market you want to Yeah, how would you figure that out? Well, it depends on what kind of product you're trying to offer. Great. How would you figure it out? You're on a roll. Um, well, this is the heart of what we're talking about here. Uh, well, you figure out what kind of, like, for like a television service, what kind of content you have, then you talk to uh, the people that you're trying to reach to. Yeah, and then what? And then you sell it to them. Yeah? You you're on a roll. Good. You can do a limited release and then see who likes it. Yeah, you can do a limited release. Right. So let me just give you an insight for a second, because it took us a long time to figure this out in Silicon Valley. 
Implicitly, when you're building a product or service, what are you trying to do for customers? What are you trying to do? You're trying to like help them with you know, your service is supposed to help them have Fair. a better life in some way. Great. Excellent, actually. So one thing you might be trying to do is solve a problem, right? Either a business problem or a social problem. There's another thing you might want to do. Who's doing the games? Right? You're trying to solve a problem? Um, we're kind of, we're trying to solve. We're tr solving the problem people will be bored with their yeah, right, 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 right. That's, so, so the nice part about games, boy, is that what you told your mother? That's why I'm playing. I'm just kind of bored. So this, um, video games, having done one of those companies, and cratered it, by the way, um, video games falls into a category of social needs. And needs are different than problems. A problem could solving is a medical device or a spreadsheet or a computer. But human beings are kind of wired for needs. Entertainment is a need. And by need, I mean we really don't need them, but we're wired to be entertained. We're wired to communicate. We're wired to you know, gamble. There are some basic things that we used to do one-on-one -on -one as individuals that are now moving online. What are some examples? What are some examples of needs that we used to do one-on-one -on -one physically? Sorry? Like talking. Chat, yep. What else? Banging. I'm sorry? Banging. Banging's, a, banging's not a need, though. What's a need? Shopping. Shopping. Yeah. For guys, it's not a need. For women, it's a need. Um, um, what else? Takeout? Yeah, because some, some of that might be need, but more like a problem. Chatting, entertainment, um, all the products that you use to communicate, Facebook, Twitter, are those problem solvings or are those needs? I would put them in the social class of needs. I just want to differentiate products that solve problems and products that kind of push a button for our psyche. And because what you're looking for is whether people actually raise their hand and says, that solves a problem or fulfills a need for me. And so what I'm getting at is your first level of talking to potential customers and users is figuring out whether your guesses that people care are matched by people outside your building who say, yes, we do care. Is that clear? You want to find other people who believe the same as you before you build anything. This is a big idea. It's a big idea. If you're starting a company and you're passionate, you need to find other people outside of your office or building who care as much about the idea, not about the code, not about the features, not about can you play with it now, who care. And if you can't find anybody, what does that tell you? What does that tell you? Yes. has nothing to do with your product yet. Are we talking about your product? The design. What are we talking about? The idea. We're talking about the idea. We're not even talking about features yet. Because the first thing that you usually want to do is let me add some more code or write some more features or add some more stuff. I'm asking you to test the concept of the problem or need with other people outside of your small group. And that's kind of hard. I want you to get out and just talk to people. Hey, I'm thinking about solving X. What do you think? Oh, that's the most boring thing ever. Well, you're the wrong person. OK. Now talk to some more people. I'm thinking about solving X. Not interested. Boy, if you don't hear out of 100 people, no one is interested, it's kind of an early warning sign. Doesn't mean I wouldn't do it, but it should make you pause. Does this make sense? Right? Doesn't mean you can't be a visionary. It doesn't mean you can't say, I've come back, I've talked to 100 people, and they all don't get it. But I would certainly want to know that before I proceed. It doesn't mean I'm take, doing a focus group and adding up all the responses. Because when I'm talking to people, I would really ask them, so what are your top five problems? 
If it isn't this, what do you really care about? The second thing you want to do is as you get that data, you want to, in parallel, be building the product. And you want to start testing the solution, and this is back to you, as early as possible. As early as possible. And this is a notion called the minimum viable product, meaning I want the smallest possible features tested now to get feedback. I don't want an order. I don't want people to play the game or buy the product. I want them to react to, well, I heard you said you had this kind of problem. What if I delivered something that looked like this? And if you're lucky, someone will grab you by the collar and say, you're not leaving until I get, can get this. And what usually happens is they go, eh. And you go, well, what does eh mean? Yeah, I don't know. If you can get some kind of reaction that tells you you are on the right path, then you continue. If, in fact, you get no reaction or a different reaction, it allows you to change what you're working on. Now, what happens to most startups is that as you get out of the building and have these conversations way before you ship, you will discover that one or more of your business model hypotheses are wrong. And that's a fancy way for saying is, you might discover that your customers are wrong, or your pricing is just like screwy, or you, know, you had the wrong features. You thought these were the top 10 features. Customers tell you number two, seven, and 12 is what they really pay for. Now, in the old days, you wouldn't figure that out until you spent a lot of money, a lot of time, and fired your first VP of sales. Nowadays, we actually understand that that is a normal course of a startup. And when you find something substantive that needs to change, we call that a pivot. And a pivot is when you see one of those things that are wrong, and you need to change them, and you do. My customers are not you know, teens 14 to 18. They're actually middle-aged women who live in Nebraska 45 to 55. No joke, I actually found that out in one of my co companies. Right? That is a huge pivot. Instead of continuing the product for one target audience, you moved it to another. And instead of waiting months or years to find that out, it was a wrenching change. But we made it. So with that, um, I want to take some questions about startups or customer development, or business models, or lean startups, or pivots, or did any of this make any sense at all? Yeah. Um, there's a book called The Startup Owner's Manual that, uh, in fact, there's a set of books that you should probably have on your shelf. The first one is uh, a book about business models. Remember I was talking about those nine boxes? There's a guy named Alexander Osterwalder who wrote a book called Business Model Generation. Um, if I had any book on a shelf, if you were doing a startup, I'd have that one. Um, it's all pictures, so you don't have to read it. That's why I like it. You can draw those nine boxes. And, and in fact, you could download the first 70 pages for free if you could find this PDF online. It's really good. Um, the second is uh, Eric Reese wrote a book called The Lean Startup. Eric was the best student I ever had, actually. Um, I'm sorry, question? I just I didn't get the First book, business model generation. So I'm going to give you a list of things if you ever feel like reading. Um, Osterwalder's book, Business Model Generation. Eric Reese's book was The Lean Startup, which is kind of a philosophy about what I just talked about. If you want some tactics, that is, what do I do on day one and day two, and how do I actually go do this? Uh, I wrote a book called The Startup Owner's Manual. Um, you can get that. There's a previous book, which was actually in my class notes, called The Four Steps to the Epiphany. Um, and there's a website that has a ton of tools for startups called steepblank.com. And there's a tab on top, which you'll just see called Startup Tools. And you could kind of, if you're in software or hardware or even medical devices, there's um, um, a lot of things I would actually go check out, reading lists, et cetera. Could you uh, repeat the name of the website again? Steveblank.com, named after somebody. <laughs> um, so let me take some questions. Yes? Um, 
how does how does your talk target audience change that much from, i'm sorry how does your target audience change that much from say you said like 14 year old how or kids why to middle-aged women um I, what about both is it is that something to expect and what was your experience with that this was a company i actually was on the board of uh, called imvu um, and eric reese was the cto and head of customer development and we had a hypothesis that we were building avatars and video games and teens would love it. Um, and it turns out they did, but they weren't paying for it. It turns out the people who were paying for it were middle-aged women who were bored in the Midwest who were using them as dress-up dolls. And they were paying an average of $350 a year in buying, in buying online clothing. And like we looked at the data and went, say what? Um, completely unexpected. And we, uh, f for the first year or two, pivoted the product to um, at least uh, address that as a customer segment. We didn't uh, completely abandon the teens, but it was just an unexpected uh, uh, looking at data. And there was no way we could have pre-computed this. In computer science parlance, by the way, a startup is, is an NP-complete problem, meaning it's computationally insolvable sitting in your room. When we get out and start talking to people, and actually as early as possible, we can make it an NP hard problem, meaning it's very hard, but it is solvable because we've collapsed all the potential trillion things you could do just to kind of thousands of things you could do. Doesn't guarantee success, but the process I've been talking about, we now over a decade know will make a startup fail less. I can't guarantee you will make you succeed more, but if you follow this process, it dramatically changes um, uh, uh, your success rate by eliminating the thousand stupid things you tend to do. And I don't mean you specifically, but in general. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, yes. Um, so in a lot of companies, you, know, you have a couple, um, <laughs> a couple directions to go in. Yep. Where you see them, like do you, how do you recommend kind of dealing with that? Do you? Go in one direction and know the other ones might be there. Go, like kind of yeah, branch so, out. So, so, so I'm going to give you the best advice you're ever going to hear. You ready? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, that unfortunately, there's a lot of advice. That's the best advice. Your, your job as an entrepreneur, actually, at the end of the day, among the 700 things else you got to do, is to figure out which advice is relevant to you. So with that caveat, I'm going to give you my opinion. And it's not the way to do it. It's a way, OK? Um, I tend to, um, my style was start broad, get enough data, and, and we'll define enough in a second, and then go deep and run it to the ground. And usually, I would end up with a pivot anyway. Um, other people will start you know, narrow and then go broad. It really is a style and efficiency thing. Uh, I tended to be incredibly curious, read a lot, interested in a variety of segments. But then when I started seeing a pattern in the noise, so for example, I'd start a company, believe my customers could be maybe these five or 10 different segments, visit a ton of them. And then when I started hearing things consistently and what I was listening for were you know, a bunch of variables. Would they pay? How quickly would they adopt the product, et cetera? I would then say, I think this is the segment. Let's go deep on this and figure out if we could get more that look like this. You know, Part of being an entrepreneur is having great product recognition, um, pattern recognition skills. Um, but it also requires you to be curious because the connections you make are across a, a variety of, of um, almost at first what seems to be seemingly random pieces of data. Did I answer your question? Yeah. All right. So my my personal style happened to be broad and then deep you know, into each customer segment. But remember, what you're looking for is product market fit at first, and and then eventually, you know. Yeah, I got product market fit, but I might have it for people who love it but won't pay for it. Right? Other questions? Back and then you. So there has been a lot of debate. Are there people with questions just sitting in the, in the front, or is, do, do I not have peripheral vision? And, uh, 
So there's been a lot of debate amongst our group about business plans and the value of business plans. Right. So, so is your so whatever Tim Draper says goes, but um, <laughs> uh, I think they're great. I'm uh, sorry. Finish your question. So, so is your um, take on it that it's an excellent tool among your company to um, have all the goals aligned and all of the different parameters thought out, but not so valuable in raising capital directly, as in the investors aren't going a to read actually, them. Actually, uh, 180 degrees. Okay. So let me give you my version, and then I would default to Tim's expertise. And so here's here's the Steve version. For 40 years, we've confused an operating document, which is a business plan, with actually doing the planning, right? Uh, in large companies, existing companies, Ford. General Motors, U.S. Steel. You could do a business plan for a follow-on product, and that plan is a great document. Because in a large company, what do you know? What do you know in a large company about your next new product? You have a sense of your customers. You know who your customers are? What else do you know? You know how much it's going to cost to build a similar product. Right. You know cost. What else do you know? You understand your market quite right. well. You understand. There's a series of knowns. It's a huge idea. A business plan could be an operating document in a large company. And that forecast in the back is not a fantasy, it's actually, you know, plus or minus, probably pretty true. And therefore, you could hire executives that's, and say, execute this plan. Now, the problem is, is that the people who came to this valley 40 or 50 years ago as investors went to business school and or were finance people, most of them. And what they learned in an MBA education is how to write a business plan and how to manage that stuff. The mistake we made in Silicon Valley was thinking that startups are smaller versions of large companies. In practice, we simply know that's not true. VCs know it's not true, whatever. Founders are different than operating executives. What founders do is actually something we can now get down into a sentence. Founders are great at search. Startups exist to search for a business model. Large companies execute models. You have great people who are wonderful at execution. And by the way, most founders don't make that transition very well. But at the same time, most op uh, existing large company operating executives melt down when it's search. And by search, I mean being comfortable in the chaos of not quite knowing what it is you're supposed to be doing from hour to hour and day to day. I'll give you Steve's definition of a startup, which will go back to answering your question. My definition of what your job is in a startup, a startup is a temporary organization designed to search for a scalable and repeatable business model. It's a big idea. First of all, startup's a temporary organization. Yeah, you like to bring your dog to work, and it's fun, and there's free food, et cetera. But really, is, is the goal to be a small company? What's the goal? To be a large, be a large company. company, right? So it's a temporary organization designed to search. Boy, if you're still searching after 10 years, it's a failure, right? So you're searching for something. What are you searching for? Well, remember I used the word business model? Who the customers? What's the channel? What's the right pricing? You're trying to figure that all out. And you're trying to figure it out so you can have something repeatable and scalable. Repeatable means I do something on Wednesday, and it's the same thing as I do on Friday. And scalable means I put a dollar in, and I get $2 out. Oh, now I got a definition of a startup. A business plan is a static execution operating document. It's eventually you get to write operating documents after you figure out <laughs> what it is you're operating for. And that was the mistake we've made. Does that answer your question? Yes. So while, while I like, yeah, let's go write down the team and let's you know, write down whatever and do the forecast, and I tell my students you ought to write a business plan, except you ought to be in the English department, because it's the best example of creative writing you're going to do in college. Um, there is no relationship between a business plan and actually what you do. So I find that incredibly frustrating, though it is, for most VC firms, still the price of entry to come in. And that's really kind of a disconnect. Um, I now have about nine VCs I teach a class in this on. And every one of them who now teaches with me has abandoned business plans after they watch what happens when we use business models. 
because I have, and they have now, people coming in presenting business models, not business plans. Other question? When, when coming with your minimum product, yes. and, oh. when come with your minimum product and going to the customers, uh, yep. what's the most effective way to get an accurate idea of, you know, did I miss it? Do I need to go here? Or is this just Constant that? iteration. So I, remember, this isn't the focus group. Right? A, a focus group is you know, getting people in a room, somebody mentioned that earlier, writing down all the whatever. Accountants don't run startups. It's a big idea. Accountants. I, I have yet to find an accountant to be a founder of a company. This is not a math problem. What you're looking for is insight, not just data. You're gathering data, but what you're really interested in, which is why I don't suggest SurveyMonkey, as a substitute for watching somebody's pupils dilate. What you're looking for is the outlier com conversation. I have actually got rich when a venture capitalist called Bill Davidow threw me out of his office saying, gee, this is the most screwed up idea, Steve, I've ever heard you have. You know, we're not funding this because it's too bad you're not doing X. And as literally he threw me out across his door frame, I still remember the moment, I went, Shit, that's a pretty good idea. I ought to do X. <laughs> and Bill passed on funding by a company called Epiphany. I returned a billion dollars to each of the two VCs who did fund Epiphany. Thank you, Bill Davidow, for you know, giving me the ideas. I was walking out. And as Bill and I still joke about it, he said, yeah, sometimes you fund the idea, but you ought to remember you're funding the entrepreneur. And you know, I was like smart enough. And, and what I'm trying to teach you guys is you're listening to those words. Right? You're still focused on your vision, but every once in a while someone will say, yeah, too bad you're not doing X, and you'll go, crap, why aren't I not doing X? And so you need to bo be both focused on the vision, but loose enough to be here and going, wait a minute, did I just get some insight or it was just this an outlier? And if I could tell you how to differentiate the, those two, we'd all be rich. But it's actually the skill of an entrepreneur is making those connections as you go talk to people. I don't know if I answered your question, but... All right. Any other questions? This side of the room. Come on. There has to be a question. No? All right. No. Yeah, have a question? I'll think of one second. All right. Well, this is just making my mind go in terms of my business. And, um, so I'm just going to run through my yeah. train of thought right now. Yeah. Um, so I've been, I've been teaching little bits of my, of my product, yep. which is like 10 minutes of a combination of making your body feel better from all the tweaks of sitting at yep. a desk and then centering your mind. So it's like I get this group or, or a group mm -hmm. to do it and then I hear all their feedback and then my first product would be doing 30 videos and then to, to first launch that, go on local TV stations, everybody wants to fill that and say go to sati.com, get the initial group and then get the feedback and then it would be going from there. Is that a good... Sure, but and, and, and I would even break it down further. What's the minimum thing you could do, like, you know, today to kind of test some of this stuff? Is, it, is there an intermediate step before you even go to TV? Is it like make one video and yeah, start? Yeah, I got getting, a dozen videos. Great. And, and I got that and up. You, are you getting the right reaction from people? Are they, like, opening up their wallets? I need it. Well, it doesn't. It's still free. We <laughs> still have the, we're still. Okay. Eventually you want a business model that's not free, right? Yeah. Well, the plan is to get, to get base users. Once we have enough base users, then add sponsorship and all that. Great. Have you talked to any stuff. sponsors? No, I should talk to sponsors, huh? Well, think about it. If you were, okay. uh, um, let me do this as the, as the last question, because this is a great idea. All right. So you're going to have free users, right? Right. All right. But you're going to have, thank goodness, payers, right? What's that? You're going to have people who are going to pay, right? They're yes. sponsors. Yes. Right? Know any other business that has um, users or viewers and payers? Facebook. Facebook. What else? YouTube. YouTube. What else? Pandora is the apparel. Pandora. What, what else? Yeah. Google. Anybody use Google? How much do you pay? Um, I pay my information. Yeah, how much do you pay? When you, is there a credit card slot when you use Google? No. All right. Everybody here uses Google for free, right? They're the most profitable company on the web. How do they do that? Advertisers. Well, wait a minute. What, you use Google. What do you see when you use Google? What product do you see? Uh, I see a reliable. No, no. What do you see when you, when you do it? Where do you type in your words? Um, in the middle of the page. Yeah, search bar. search bar. 
What product do the advertisers see? Something related to your search. What do they see? <laughs> they see, I'm sorry? Google they see a completely different product, Google AdWords. Big idea. When you have users and payers, in, in at least Google's case, the users see one product, advertisers are seeing another. There are two value propositions. Customer segments. There are users, but there are also payers. And who are the payers for Google? Who are they? The advertisers. Advertisers. How many users are there for Google? Millions. Hundreds of millions? Maybe a billion closing in. How many payers are there? Maybe hundreds of thousands. Yeah, maybe 10,000 that actually they make their most money of. You don't pay anything, right? So the revenue model for you is, yeah, 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 but for cash, we're talking about stuff that matters, right? The revenue model for you is zero. What's the revenue model for payers? Anybody know? What's the model? How do they pay? Uh, payers, so they pay for keywords. But how they pay? What's the, what's the metric? Pay per click. That's the revenue model. By the way, revenue model is different than pricing. Pricing would be how much do they pay per click. And that happens to be variable depending on whether the click is. So think about this. If you think about a business model for Google, multiple value propositions, multiple customer segments, multiple revenue models. By the way, the Google model for that, you might know who invented that? <coughs> Newspapers, 1830s. Right? Google models nothing more than newspapers, 1830s, radio, 1920s, television, 1950s. Same model. Your model, users and payers. But if all you're doing is figuring out who the free users are on day one, you might want to consider yeah. Yeah. <laughs> whether those users you're getting, how valuable are they and to who? It's not like you have to show them I have a million users or 10,000. I'd be kind of interested. That's your hypothesis about how you're going to make money. Great. Let's assume you'll have 10,000 people or 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. Can you just kind of do me a favor and humor me and see if you could find some sponsors today who would say, yes, if you brought me those people, here's how much I would pay. And then very soon you'll go, yes, or oh my god, that's all they're going to pay. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah. And the last piece, for somebody doing medical devices, you want to see what a miserable job she has to do. You ready? Who's the customer? The insurance companies. Well, uh, insurance company? Really? Are you selling it to the insurance company? Why are they a customer? They're, because they're the ones that's actually paying for the product. They're oh. convinced the doctors that they're going to kill it. Big idea. In medical devices, unless you have a reimbursement code, don't get any money. So insurance company. Who else? Uh, so the, phys the physician has some. Ah, so there's a doctor. Who else? Patient. Patient. Oh, yes, them. Who else? The FDA. FDA. Who else? Hospital, holy cow. <laughs> so there are some business models, right, that have multiple moving parts, right? So for each one of those, you have different customers, different value propositions, different revenue models, right? And you have it easy, right? You have it, hey, the, in some places, the customer is the user and the payer. In other businesses, you need to keep track of all these moving parts. And unless you test them on day one, you might be surprised. So I have students who built some great medical devices, got all the pieces right, but forgot in the United States that distribution for low-cost medical devices controlled by two distributors in the US. And they decided that their pro these students' products was too competitive. They didn't want it, forced them out of the market in the US. Never bothered to ask that question. They could have saved two and a half years worth of work or at least figured out how to address it early. So um, I know we're out of time, and uh, thank you very much for yours.